Welcome, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. Um, so we're going to get into the meeting. Um, again, this month's topic is on Mojave, and I'm going to go over a number of new features and updated features inside of Mojave. Um, we will take questions at the end of the presentation, and with a little bit of luck, we'll even have time to do some showing you um, how some of the features work. So that is my goal for this month's meeting. So this month's meeting is on Mojave Mac OS 1014. Uh, this is Apple's newest operating system for the computers. Um, so far, so good with this one, I think. Um, doesn't seem to be a lot of issues that people are complaining about. I'm sure there's probably a few things that people are not happy with. But for the most part, um, most people think this upgrade was a good one. And some of the features that are in it really, at first you would think they were underwhelming. But when you look a little further in it, it's, oh, well, that's not a bad thing. So hopefully, if you haven't upgraded to this, you'll be able to in the near future. Apple's website does have a list of the computers that are compatible with this. So for the most part, if you are running anything 2012 or newer, you're not going to have any issues. If you're running something older than that, this isn't going to run it. With the exceptions of the 2010 and the 2012 Mac Pros, but that's only if you have a graphics card in it that can handle the metal um, interface. So if it can do that, you, you stand a chance of being able to run Mojave on it. My Mac Pro from 08 keeps getting up, asked all the time, hey, update to Mojave. I'm running El Capitan on that machine. <laughs> I'm not going any further because I can't. But it'd be nice if I could. Cap hey, Brian. Uh, other world is doing Maxell.com is selling a list, or has a list of all of the video cards. Your machine is metal. My machine will not be metal compatible ever. And that's what OWC told me. Really? Yeah. It's in 2008. It's, too old. it's an 8. If it's a 10 or higher, I'm good. But in, uh, 08s, 09s, you're out of luck. So that's the end of that. And I'm okay with that because I've upgraded to a Mac Mini, the brand new one. And that thing runs circles around that Mac Pro, which I'm very, very pleased with. So moving in, some of the new features in Mojave include dark mode, stacks, finder, quick look, screenshots, continuity camera, which is pretty intriguing. It also includes Apple News. FaceTime got a long overdue upgrade. Voice memos and stocks. Home, which is HomeKit on your computer finally, which I'm tickled about. Um, also Safari got more secure and the Mac App Store got completely redone. So there are some things there that are going to be a little different than what you're probably used to. We're going to touch on all of those and then when we're finished we'll walk through some questions and do a little presentation as well. So first up, dark mode. So a lot of people ask me, well what's the whole point of dark mode? It just makes my screen darker? That's all it does? Well, a little bit. It does make the screen a little darker at certain times of the day. What it does is, I think, it brings a dramatic look to your desktop and your built-in apps. Now, not all apps are supporting dark mode yet, but they're getting there. This makes it easy to focus on what matters most, your content. Um, to switch between light and dark mode appearances, you open System Preferences and under General, there's a button you can click to enable it or turn it off. The one thing I like personally about dark mode is in the morning, my screen looks like the one on the top, nice and bright. That picture is daylight. But in the evening, when I open up my computer, I'm not blinded by the screen coming on and all that bright light hitting me in the face. 
because now it gives me a darker image to look at, which I personally like that a lot. And that way I don't have to squint for a couple of seconds waiting for my eyes to adjust to the brightness. Because I will admit, at night, I'm sitting in my favorite chair in a semi-dark room. And you open that up and suddenly it's like a spotlight hit me in the face. I've noticed that. Brian. Uh, explain, please. Well, if, if you don't want to get, so you turn on your computer at 6 a.m. Yes. What does the screen look like? Screaming bright or the dark mode? At 6.30 it's dark mode. Because it, it waits to find out when sunrise is. Okay. So Which is sort of neat. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Yeah. It picks up from your through location. It picks up when the, the sun's rising and setting, and it makes the adjustment for you. Okay. So the ever famous 924 in the morning is nice and bright, and 924 at night is dark, which is pretty cool. So. But you have your choice. You can also set up a schedule if you don't want it to sunrise to sunrise. Yeah. Or you can just set dark mode and just be always on dark mode. Yeah. So now, um, Next up, stacks. So stacks is something that always drives me crazy when a customer comes in and I open their computer and I see that. I see everything all over the place. Drives me nuts. Because it's like, you got such a nice screen. Why are you cluttering it up? Well, with stacks, now it does this. And it cleans all your stuff up for you. It just snaps it over to the right side of the screen and you are semi-organized. And so for some of us, like myself, who are not real organized, this can be very helpful. But this is a really great feature. Um, if you were like certain people I helped last week that they like to keep their folders in certain locations on the screen, and you don't want to use stacks, what you do is in the finder bar, menu bar, you choose view, use stacks, or turn off stacks. So if you don't want this, you can disable it, and it's pretty straightforward. Um, and then if you want to see what's in a stack, just click on it, and it'll show you. The nice thing is, is when you do choose to use it, all the files on your desktop get gathered into stacks, and they're along the right side of the screen. So it grabs all the pictures and throws them in a folder because it knows what the JPEG is. It takes all your documents, throws it in a folder. So it makes it a lot cleaner and easier to organize through. Now the people that have it so busy where they can't see their desktop at all, and I have seen those, I think all of us know somebody that's done that. Um, it's gonna be a big change for them, maybe a scary change. But if you want to do that, you can also search for a recent file or a specific tag by regrouping it because you can choose view, group stacks by. So you can go by name, you can go by size. There's a lot of different features. So that'll be something that I will show you later on in the meeting. Richard. Yeah, like older computers, there's somewhere in that computer where it doesn't call it stacks, but a range. And, and on older systems, there is something that you can do to organize things, but it doesn't do it as well as this. What it does is it just takes everything and shoves it over to the right, but it does not take like batches of photo and drop it into a folder called photos. So it makes it look neat. It does help make it look neat. And what's it called? What is it called? What is it called? Um, I believe it's under view and options, and then you can adjust it from there. There was something known a long time ago, a snap to grid, and that would slide everything over to the one side for you to, to arrange it a little cleaner. This is a really good improvement as long as your machine can run Mojave. So, moving on, Finder. You would think, what could they do to Finder to make it any better than it already is? 
Well, a lot. <laughs> Thank you. So, one of the things that they are touting as new and innovative, which I think some of us here may disagree, is something called gallery mode. Um, or, excuse me, gallery view, which allows you to scrub through large previews of photos to look for the file that you're looking for. And that's going to be one of the um, options up on the top of the window in Finder because you could look by list, you could look by icon. And then they had, I believe it was called, it was like the iTunes view for looking at cover art. Well, now they've changed it and they've called it gallery view and they've tweaked it, I think, enough to make it something that's easier for some people to use. Um, some people want to look at a list. Some people want to look at icons. And so there's your personal preference on how you want to look at your files. I personally think looking at a list is easy, but that's for me because I'm more than happy to read and see what it is to get to that point. Um, and then the preview pane, when you're using gallery view, shows the complete metadata. So that way you can confirm details such as the camera model or the exposure that was used to take that photo. Um, you can click the thumbnails along the bottom of the window to quickly preview a file without having to actually open it, which is pretty cool. Um, the other nice feature is, is you can go in and make quick changes with the quick actions. So that'll allow you to rotate an, ish, an image, combine files into a PDF, and more. Um, in Finder, you'll select one or more files and click the option at the bottom of the preview pane. Preview pane is always on the right side of the window, and the bottom of the pre at the bottom of the preview pane, you can add buttons for actions that maybe you perform on a regular basis. Next is Quick Look. Quick Look um, is sort of unique in the fact that you used to be able to click on a file, hit the space bar, and that was Quick Look. And it would open up that image so you could see it without opening the program. Okay, but that's all you could do with it. Now, Quick Look will let you open a PDF file and sign it without opening preview or whatever PDF app that you're using. It will also let you make some simple edits, like cropping a photo. Um, and it'll even let you trim a video clip. So there are some nice handy little features in with that to make things go a little faster, go a little easier. And it's just something that you get into it and you realize, hey, this is not difficult. This is pretty straightforward. So just by clicking the markup button, it allows you to do that. So there's a lot of really neat features with this. But this, again, these features really are, you're going to sit down and play with them to get the most out of them and find out if it's something that you want to use. Because at the very least, you should give it a shot and see if it's something helpful for you. Screenshots, we're all familiar with um, Command Shift 3, Command Shift 4, people with touch bar, it's Command Shift 6. Well, now it's Command Shift 5. But Command Shift 5 lets you highlight an image, it lets you move the bars so you can capture exactly what you want instead of Command Shift 4 where you have to drag the cursor over it. Now it highlights it up for you. And the neat thing is, once you say capture, it puts the picture in the corner. So if you are working on something, say like a keynote presentation, and you need an image, you can go find that image capture it, and then drag it from the corner of the window on top of what you want, and it just drops in. Instead of you downloading it, opening up Finder to get into your downloads, finding the right picture, having to search through what could be a lot of them in there, now it's right there nice and handy 
So you can just move it over. And for me, that's a tremendous time saver. So um, screenshots definitely stepped up big with that. Um, the, it'll capture a still selection, or you can do a whole screen if you want to record your entire screen. The screenshot, like I said, shows up as a small palette in the corner, which you can drag to reposition it. It also gives you options for where you want to save that screenshot and whether to show the pointer and more. Um, after you have got it saved, um, at that point you just move it to where you want it, whether it's into a folder, whether it's into a document. Um, you can just swipe to the right to quickly save it, or you can click it to mark it up, and share, or even share it. So there's a lot of great features that are part of this. Next, continuity camera. I actually said that right this time. So you can shoot a picture on your phone, and then you can see it on your Mac without having to wait for iCloud to take that picture, upload it to the cloud, and then download it onto the computer. So what it'll do is, if you're in, say, Pages, you're working on a document, you can choose Insert, then you can choose Import from iPhone or iPad, and then Take Photo, and it will let you grab that picture that you took and drop it into that document. So if you've if you, you've got a picture and it's all good, ready to go, you can now easily move it into something to so you can you know speed up your progress. So it's a it's a pretty cool little feature in there. Again, it is something that try it, you'll probably like it a lot, and you should probably play with it. Next up. Apple News. There's more than enough news in the world for all of us. But Apple has gone into this market and they are trying to turn this into your one-stop destination for trusted news and information. As they say, it is curated by editors and it is personalized for you. I'm not sure how they're personalizing it, but I'm thinking it's based on maybe where you go on sites and they'll, they'll personalize it that way for you. You can also use the sidebar in Apple News to pick topics. Sorry? Oh, that was you. Oh, that's nice. So um, the sidebar in Apple News will let you discover top topics or channels or jump straight to your favorites that you've ended up saving. So. It's a really nifty thing. Um, it may not replace your normal news source, but I think it would complement it at the very least. Next, FaceTime. FaceTime's a really cool thing, and with the holidays upon us, a lot of people will use FaceTime to stay in, stay in touch with family members and friends. FaceTime finally will let you do more than just one person to FaceTime with. It will now let you do up to 32 people. That's a lot of people. I don't think I want to talk to that many people at the same time. And that, but I wouldn't mind being able to have maybe five or six people for the holidays for, you know, after a meal. Hey, let's talk to grandma and grandpa. Let's talk to my aunt, my uncle. Oh, my nephew's over here. This is a pretty great way to help families stay in touch. I also see it as a good way for businesses to stay in touch with other people when you're working on something. One of the things that I have not figured out just yet is during the FaceTime call, when you add the people in, and it can be either from um, an email address or a phone number, I am assuming the email address is what you're using for your Apple ID, but I'm not positive on that yet. Um, if you enter that in, you can click audio or video for making the call. So 
You need to have a conference call without video? No problem. You can do it with FaceTime now. You want to do a, a video chat? You can do that. The one neat thing that I thought is going to be a little hard at first is if you have, say, 15, 20 people and you see their picture on the screen, what it's going to do is whoever is talking, their picture gets bigger on your screen. So if there's a conference call going on and there's a heated discussion, I'm expecting there's going to be a lot of balloons going up and down during that call. Um, so with a little luck, people will be courteous and allow them to finish what they're saying before jumping in. But we'll see how that works out. Um, so it's sort of neat. One of the other things is... Is there a moderator? No. No, there's not. It's a free-for-all. Yeah. But one of the nice things are, there's a mute button. Now it's for yourself, but there's a mute button. So if you want to hit mute so they can't hear what you're doing, like maybe you get a phone call that you've got to take, you can mute yourself. You can also click off the camera as well. So if you need to be part of it, you can still be there, but they can turn the camera off. So that's sort of neat. Um, if you need to make somebody the focus of your attention during this, my understanding is, is if you click on their photo, it will highlight it and make them more, you'll get more focus on just them and maybe their reactions to what somebody is saying rather than... Um, just hearing everybody ramble on. So um, you can add additional people once the call is in progress um, simply by clicking the sidebar button and adding them in. So again, FaceTime's gotten a lot of overdue features that should make it a little easier to use, although we may not all need it. We may only need this a couple of times a year. But it's nice to know that you can bring everybody together and if instead of just doing a text message of, hey, we have this emergency, what do we do? Now you have everybody there and you don't have to worry about misunderstandings about what somebody typed versus what somebody meant. So I think that's a great feature right there. Next up is stocks. So most people, if they're interested in stocks and things like this, they probably are dealing with an app already for keeping track of this, maybe through their broker, maybe through another source, maybe just through the news sites where they're just keeping track of it. This one, Apple sort of took what they do on the phones and the iPads and improved it for the Mac. And it was sort of silly that it hasn't been on the Mac beforehand, but now it is. The neat thing is with this, instead of just seeing where the stock is at, whether it's up, whether it's down, this gives you more history on it if you pick a stock. It also has a news app built into the app itself to help you stay on top of, well, what's going on with this company? What's going on with that company? Is Apple still suing Qualcomm? Is Qualcomm still suing Apple? <coughs> Those kind of things. And I think for some people, this is going to be very, very handy. For the people that I just don't care, well, then you don't even have to open the app. Um, next up, voice memos. So having voice memos, this app on your computer, um, It'll make it easier than ever when you are trying to capture, say, a personal reminder. My daughter thinks this is great because now she can record her class lectures and have it on the computer. And it's just perfect. And she can scrub through those because that's what voice memos allows you to do. She can go right to the part of the class where, okay, it was about halfway through. Let me scrub to there. Okay, that's what they said. Boom and go from there and she can move forward with her notes and her research. So 
hitting the record button starts it. You can trim it or replace part of it by just clicking at it. They made it really, really simple to use. Um, I wouldn't say it is feature laden, but it has enough features to do what I think most people would need to get them by. Um, it'll keep your recordings and your edits up to date across all your devices. And I'm assuming, again, that's because you're signed in with your Apple ID on all your devices. So you could record on your phone or your iPad and then use it on your Mac to do the editing and everything else because it'll keep that in, in play for you. Yes. Yes. And that's just grabbing the mic from over the air. That's a pretty clear recording. That's a pretty clear recording. So that's a nice feature. All right, moving along. Home for Mac. I am unable to express how tickled I am that this is finally on the Mac because this essentially is HomeKit that you can do on your phone, that you can do on your iPad. And I've been waiting for this to show up on the computer for the longest time. I have jumped head first into that rabbit hole of home automation and I'm just tickled pink with it. And now that I can do this on the computer, it's easier than on my phone trying to set up a rule and fat fingering the time and then trying to fix it. Now I can do it on the computer and it's a lot simpler. Um, this will give you full HomeKit compatibility that you're using with your phone or your <coughs> iPad, but now on the computer. So everything that you pull up, you want to turn a light on, you want to turn a light off, you want to check if the garage door is open or, is open or closed, the door, there you go. It's going to do it. This will even work with cameras. I've got two cameras set up, and on the HomeKit app, at any time, I can pull it up and I can see what's going on in two different rooms in the house, which is nice and easy. I don't have to open up the camera app to do it. I can just do it through the HomeKit app or now on the computer, the Home app. So really great features there. Um, you can also set it up that, you know, if somebody's at your front door and you've got a HomeKit compatible, say, doorbell or a camera out there, um, you can set it up to get notifications or what the status is and make your life hopefully a little easier and a little less to worry about. Um, it'll let you view all your accessories and your cameras at the same time. So that's a good feature. Um, and then even setting them up with the scene. One of the neat things with HomeKit is telling Siri to turn off the lights. And that's, that turned my wife from a non-believer into a full believer <coughs> because the greatest thing was you spent how much on a HomePod? Yeah, it's playing music. Yeah. What else can it do? And then I did the, hey Siri, turn on bedroom lights. Oops, sorry. <laughs> There's some lights going on in my house right now. <laughs> so, <laughs> but by doing that, my wife just looked at me and said, okay. And so she said the magic word and said, turn off bedroom lights. And the lights went off. And she's like, okay, because without her glasses, she is blind as a bat. She said, that speaker is not worth every penny you paid for it. So it's a great thing. Her one little thing that she really likes to do after she tells her to turn off the lights, is she tells her good night. And Siri will tell her good night to her. No, thanks. So that'll happen. Um, last night she told us a bedtime story, which was sort of like, oh, 
okay. <laughs> and we, you know, we got a little good night room, good night moon, good night this. And, oh, okay. That's amusing. So it worked out pretty darn well. Yes. When you set up Siri to turn on your lights, can you also turn on and off your lights manually? Yes. Yes, you can. Because the the lights that we have plugged up are connected to just switches. So it's a wall plug. And the light plugs into that, and then that plugs into the wall plug. And there is a switch on that plug where I can manually override the lights to turn them on or off. Right now, my wife has one, two, three, five lights that come on at 4 o'clock and go off at 11 p.m. every day. And those are, she has some holiday stars in the front window. She has a little, I'm sure everyone is aware, someone's grandma had that little ceramic tree with the little lights in it that they made, you know, a long time ago. We have her grandmothers in our house. And so she has that on a switch. So now she doesn't have to reach behind the table to click it on and off when she wants it. Now it just comes on. We have lights set up in the back room that'll do that. And we even have um, some holiday decorations outside, some garland with lights in it. And then she's got these little like gift box things that light up. And those are on an outdoor switch that is HomeKit compatible. And so they come on, they go off. And her joke was, you wouldn't have to go around turning lights on and off anymore when we used to put lights up on the roof. I gave that up because every time I went to put lights on the roof, there was always a nice storm the day before. So I'm done with putting lights on the roof. So it, our electric bill appreciates that. Right. Uh, I have pets. Yes. Uh, as it turns out, Nest does not work with HomeKit. Even though Nest was created by Tony Fidel, who created the iPod, when he created Nest, it was, oh, it'll be coming. And then when I believe it was Amazon bought Nest, they said, yeah, we'll get to it. So as of right now, my Nest smoke detectors do not work with HomeKit. My first alert smoke detector and CO2 detector does. And I would really like Nest to get there because that way I would drop for a Nest thermostat in a heartbeat. Yeah. So they've got their cameras, they've got their other stuff. I like their hardware. I just wish the software would work with what I'd like to have it work with. Does, does so, HomeKit make Siri feed my birds work? No, it does not. Yeah. Jim's making a joke because he's been to my house and I have parrots. And so he's making a joke about feeding the birds. I would need a remote control bird feeder to do that. Uh, no thanks. Yeah. So, yes. Some of the switches that do Okay. So, some of the switches that work with HomeKit are um, iHome switches iDevice switches, um, Wemo will work with it, but right now they're still waiting for the HomeKit software to be approved by Apple to kick it on. So right now I have a few Wemo switches. When I use those, I have to control those separately through their own app rather than through HomeKit. Right. Right. But you need the hub to do that. Yeah. Right. Yeah. yeah, but that's sort of like the Phillips bulbs. You have to have their hub to control those switches through there as well. So you try. That works with HomeKit. Yeah, they're, I believe it's called the Casada series. They have switches um, for turning on lights so you can manually turn the light on 
or you can control it through your device. And they have one that's a dimmer and one that's just a on off kind of switch. And my understanding is they're also coming out with plugs. So you can put those plugs in the house and then you'll be able to control that plug through the home kit. Right. Yeah. So like I've got, I have all the Sonos speakers all over the house and I have to use the Sonos app to do it. Now the Sonos app now works with Apple music. So I'm really good with that. But before it was, I was using Sonos music or I was trying to stream it from one of the devices so to play. This is, this is like emerging technology, kind of like beta and VHS, and all come together at Yeah, uh, uh, essentially. I mean, there's... I wouldn't count on it all coming together at some point. Well, we can hope. We, we can Amazon truly Amazon has a vested interest in keeping their items not talking to anybody else, and so does Google. Yeah. So a lot of stuff is going to pick a side. Most stuff is picked Amazon and Google. And other stuff is picked HomeKit, which sometimes will work with Alexa and Google, but it's never all going to. You're going to have to watch what you buy. Right. You're going to have to buy into the system and watch what you buy. Yeah, because. Don't go by based on we'll do it in the future. If they tell you they're going to do it in the future, count on it not happening. Right. I was ready to buy the Canary cameras. I wanted that in the worst way because I'm like, oh, it's a good looking camera. It's got a speaker, a microphone to it. You, there's an alarm. You can just hit a button. It'll play an alarm. Hey, that's great. And they kept saying, well, we're, we're coming for Apple. We're coming for Apple. And that was four years ago. So I've, I'm using the Omna cameras. I like them a lot because they are HomeKit compatible. Just boom, done. And life is good. O-N-M-A. Omna. I, believe, I think it's dealing actually puts it out and it works really really well with it so i'm, I'm happy with it because they do grab 180 degree on it i can tell the dogs to get off the couch um, and i can see our back room i can see everything back there from that camera and the other ones from the living room so i can see the front door and if anybody's walking down the stairs or coming from the kitchen i've got a good view of all that so, yes. Yeah, we'll, we typically do one home automation meeting a year, and I am all in for doing another one and that because this stuff just keeps getting better and better. Uh, but like Jack said, you have to pick a side. Unfortunately, they're, they're not all going to play nice with each other, although Apple and Amazon have been playing nice the last few weeks because now you're going to be able to, I believe starting tomorrow, do Apple Music through your, like your Echoes and the other yes. things. Actually, I think it started yesterday. Was it yesterday? Okay. But it's, yeah, they had announced that last week saying you'll be able to stream Apple Music through those speakers now, which is, I think, a really good thing because we have Alexa in the kitchen uh, Sonos One, and then I've got two HomePods using Apple stuff on there. But it, it's sort of nice because the front door lock I'm putting on tomorrow actually works with HomeKit, and it's a quick set, the Kivo lock. So I can ask her, is the front door locked? And she'll tell me yes or no. So there's a lot of really cool features with a lot of things, but you have to pick your side on who you want to use. And if you end up with too much of this and too much of that, a lot of people get frustrated and give it all up. So, Brian. The door is actually locked or just closed? Locked. Yeah, it won't tell me if the door is closed, but it'll tell me if the door has been locked or if it's unlocked. <laughs> now it's for the deadbolt. It, it mounts on the inside of the door. So I can still use the key on the outside, and this will just allow me to... The goal was for my wife to pull up in the driveway, hit the button on the steering wheel and tell that woman to open the garage door, unlock the front door. 
That is the goal. So far I've got it to the garage door working. Now I got to get it to the, the front door. And there are then, ones that will do that. I have an August block that also has a sensor that will tell you they are or not. Okay. So that if it is open, it, it's also I have it set to automatically lock after two minutes after you unlock it. Okay. So, but it won't do it if the door is open. It won't lock okay. it, locking itself if the door is open. And you can tell then on HomeKit if the door is open yeah. and if it's locked. Yeah, because the August are, are HomeKit compatible. They're quite stylish as well. They're big, but all of them are because they all take four AA batteries. And the one thing that I found with the, the quick set one is it doesn't want you to use rechargeable batteries, which I don't know why, but on the paperwork it's use alkaline batteries only. Okay. Okay. So it, it doesn't get enough juice to. Okay. Huh. Okay. Blue? Okay. All right. Well, great. Okay. So we got four of them. Okay. So that that would explain a lot then. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Oh, well, good. That's good to know. Thank you for sharing that. Okay. So, yes, we will have a home automation meeting in the near future, and we'll we'll show off all the different things that work with and maybe don't work with um, HomeKit. So that way you can decide where you'd like to go. Um, luckily, now that it's becoming more popular, prices are finally starting to drop on these accessories. So it, it doesn't make getting into it as painful as it used to be. Okay, next, Safari. So Safari, Apple's trying to make Safari more secure and also to make sure that the privacy levels are top notch. So what's going to happen is um, when you're browsing the web, advertisers try to use unique settings on the Mac to create a fingerprint to track you. So we all know about cookies and things like that. Um, the new version of Safari in Mojave now makes targeting that more difficult. So a lot of people, myself included, may be running an ad blocker. Um, in their browser to prevent them from being tracked and going from there. And typically you go and you click on another site and you get the pop-up saying, hey, we see you're using an ad blocker. Can you turn that off? And my answer has always been no, because I don't need you. I understand that's how you get your revenue, but, you know, part of your revenue by being able to drop a cookie and then have the ads specifically sent to me based on what I am either researching or shopping for. So um, this new, as they're saying, intelligent tracking prevention is geared specifically towards social media sites. So the example that is up on the screen is Facebook. And someone has once said that if you're getting something for free, you're no longer the customer, you're the product. And that's exactly what is going on. We've all become products because, oh, well, we'll give you this feature and it won't cost you anything. So 
I have to explain to people daily that, yes, you can use Google Photos. No problem. You can back all your pictures up to Google Photos. They're giving you that space for free. Great. Did you read the fine print? No. So if you put pictures into Google Photos, you have given away the rights to all of those images to Google for them to use it any way they want, including advertising. And I have a friend that works for Google and he told me that, oh yeah, we are data mining pictures all the time, looking for an image. They're like, we need an image of this. And so they are scouring their drives that have your pictures on it for that image. Okay. And then I tell people, well, yeah, they gave you that for free, but Apple has iCloud. We're trying to make sure that your stuff doesn't get out. We're pretty good at it so far. But yeah, you're using more than that free five gigs that we gave you. Now you have to spend 99 cents a month to get 50 gigs or 299 for 200 gigs or the, I still, it boggles my mind. For 10 bucks a month, you get two terabytes of space. That's a lot, a lot of space. Now, in a business setting, I could see where that two terabytes being shared between multiple people would not be a bad thing. But I have seen families that are on the two terabyte plan because they're all sharing everything. And they have family sharing on, so that way they can split up that two terabytes between, you know, four or five people. And, geez, they want to keep the family iPhoto library up in the air. So that way they have access to it on their devices without it living on the device. Okay, that makes sense. I'm on a 200 gig plan and I still got tons of space. Plus I'm giving it away to my, my wife and kids. So I don't mind dropping $3 a month knowing that my stuff is safe and that someone's not going to use it for whatever they feel like. And that's exactly what you get with Google Photos and some of these other services. So it is true that you get what you pay for. And if you're not paying for it, well, there's a reason. If, uh, if we go with such a service like that, that Google product, and uh, your, your photos are uploaded, Google for you, do you lose your rights in such a case to be able to sell those photos or use those photos in a presentation, like for example, a, uh, uh, a video presentation that you have assembled together, uh, a uh, Apple keynote. keynote. Okay. Uh, you developed a keynote presentation. Right. That he had more photos that you had previously. Right. Do you still have the rights to that? Is it still yours? They are still yours. But you have signed over the fact that they can use those same images for what they want to, if they want to use them, you sign that off to them. So they're yours. You can use them however you want, commercially or just, you know, on a consumer level. But so you can't sell the exclusive rights anymore. Right. You're already giving up part of the rights. Right. So a lot of photographers that were using Google Photos, they can't sell that as an exclusive piece of art to somebody because Google now owns a chunk of it and they can use it if they want. So that's, that's the big drawback. Does that make sense? Okay. Sheeta? I know you said this technology targeted social media sites and ads. What about some of the sites that say, um, uh, you know, like Facebook or Google Plus or something like that, and they're trying to get you to use their services? Is that 
this technology also I believe it probably does, but if you go in and you turn off the pop-off blocker, um, at that point I think it overrides it. Because for most part, when I see things that are, you have to turn off pop-up blocker, most of them are someone's taking an online test, or you are in a, a government website, because it's, there's a good chance it's going to redirect you. To something else and that's why you have to have that on there there are probably still websites that I think we could all agree might be a little sketchy that want you to have a turn off your pop-ups blocker so that way they can inundate you with multiple web pages of whatever they're trying to sell or whatever advertising they're trying to push upon you but I believe that this probably looks at that as well. So, Ray. If you try picture or not, pictures through it, and you realize right. you go in start. You can take them away. You still have time. Yeah. And you've agreed in a legal contract to let them use it however they see fit by agreeing to take their service for free. So if you need to have them take it out because it is, say, content that you are planning to make money off of, at that point you're probably getting a lawyer involved to get them to release, and that's probably going to cost you more money than you want to spend. But that's just, you know, that's where it's at. It's great if you're just, you know, if you have cat pictures and dog pictures and you, you don't really care if they're in Google Photos, that's good. But I think anybody on a professional level probably should be avoiding it because it's not a good thing. You need, you need something to store that stuff and you don't want to use iCloud? Okay, well, you can use Dropbox. And there's other sources that you can use too. But you're going to end up paying for that service once you hit a certain level. You know, if you want, I, th I believe Dropbox gives you two gigabyte for free. Maybe it's five now. Two? Okay. But you can hit that pretty fast if you're shoving a bunch of pictures and maybe videos up there. You can hit it. And their next plan is $99 a year for two terabytes. Well, that's a, that's a lot of space, but that's where you are. You're spending that money for that. Well, there's other options, but there's no free options. Yes, sir. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you bought two two terabyte drives. You have four terabytes of space. That's at your house. You're someplace else. You want those some of those pictures off of there. How are you getting them? That's not the way I'm no, that thing for backup. That's perfect. But a lot of people want to have access to all of that data on the fly. Okay. 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 What do you pay for that? Right. Okay. And so, where is that data? In my office. Okay. And how do they access that data? Okay. Okay. So, is it set up where it is a case of 
all that content that's on that drive is being copied to another drive so you can access it through the IP or does it talk to your computer to get access to all that data? Okay. If the power is out at your house? Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm asking these questions because there are a lot of these hard drive manufacturers offering you free cloud space. But it's on their drive. It's not on yours. So if yours is talk, when you hit that IP address and it is ringing back to your computer to access those drives on your computer, as long as that computer's up and running, it can access those drives. That's how this is working for you. Actually, my computer has nothing to do with it. It's a NAS. It's a NAS? Okay. So yours is a, it's a network array storage. Okay, so they're NAS drives. So they essentially have their own little computer inside of them <laughs> that connects to your internet and give you access to those files. Okay. Yeah. So that's a, and that's an option as well. And that, but some people, like I said, if they're on the fly, they want access to files right then and there. Okay. So your system is a, is a good way to back up your shelf as well as give you access to it. Not everyone's doing that, but NAS drives typically are not $79 a cost them. The, those typically start at a, about three, four hundred dollars and go up, and then you have to add your drops. So, okay, all right. So it's a good option. It's a very good option. Let, thank you for letting me pick your brain on that. Uh, we're good. Brittany. You don't lose the exclusive right to sell them. The problem is you've given them permission to use them. So when you go to sell an image later on, trying to give them, whoever you're selling it to, you can't guarantee it's an exclusive right because you allow Google to have that image. So is that you the can't take it back. Right. Sorry? Is that Oh, yes. Yes. Anything you put on Facebook, one, it gets optimized. So you're not getting the original photo. Um, two, Facebook can do whatever they want with whatever you post. So any of your photos, any of your videos, they can use it for whatever they'd like. Not iCloud. iCloud's so, okay. iCloud does not do that. Apple is very strong in believing in your privacy and also trying to ensure your security as well. That's social media. Yeah. Yep. Sure. Yes. And if you get asked what it was now in the iDrive, Dropbox. Yeah. That's just a storage. It's just storage. You want to show somebody those pictures. Yeah. And you guys were picking the files. Well, but in Dropbox, you can create a folder, drop the pictures into it, and send somebody a link, an invite, and they can see only what's in there. Right. Well, unless you rename it. Oh, boy, exactly. Know. It's a whole nother. So yeah. what I was going to say is smart money. It's all very smart. They've acquired uh, cancer, I think. Okay. Um, no, it's four bucks a month. Okay. And it gives you the unlimited whatever to play your pictures, Right. Okay. Sure. That crashed. 
Plasma wall and cell Seagate drive. That crash for Seagate drive. Okay. Yeah, I don't know if you I've had problems with Western Digital drives from Costco. So, okay, now that it's, it's not, at not at your store? Okay, all right. Okay, I, my understanding is not all the drive. Someone told me once that at Costco, you're not always getting top shelf equipment there, you're sometimes you're getting a reefer coming through there. And I saw that once before when they were selling Mac minis back when they were gigantic boxes. Uh, and somebody bought one at Costco. It was all shrink wrapped with a keyboard and a mouse and the whole thing. And they brought it in because they wanted to transfer data from one computer to that one. And when I pulled up the serial number of the new Mac mini, that they just bought a few days before, it was bringing it up as a refurbished product. So I don't know if that's still the case, but they move merchandise. That's their goal. And they, you know, they sell a lot of TVs. They sell a lot of hard drives. You can buy a watch. You can buy shrimp. You can buy steak. You can get everything there. So. Research is one of the best, most reliable drivers. Yeah. Yep. Seagate Seagate's been having some issues, probably for the last year, year and a half. So, but there are, if you look at some of the places that do big time data storage, you know, like server farms and things like that, um, there's a couple of them that they put down. When did we put this, what model drive this is, when we installed it, when we took it out of service, or when it failed. And there's a lot of them in there where it's like, yeah, there's, there's been a huge batch, I think, in their quality with Seagate. It's not the same. But it's, that's where that is. Yes? <coughs> Okay. Some of them are coming with Apple Care included. Oh. Some of them are not. But I asked them a question about uh, are the reverb part of the package? Okay. Well, that's good then. I mean, the fact that they're offering Apple Care with them, that's just, it turns it into a no brainer. Well, some of them are, and some of them are. Okay. Yeah. So they got a little green care. Yeah. Because Costco changed their electronic return policy a couple years ago because my neighbor used to go and buy a TV before the Super Bowl. And he would keep it for a week and then he would return it. And they now will no longer do that. And there was, you know, because I, I've heard of people buying a printer at Costco and taking it back three years later. Because they used to have that policy, oh yeah, if it ever goes bad, just come see us. And they would just return it. And, you know, obviously that printer is no longer the current model, so they would return it and get the next version going from there. And it's like, you ran out of ink. That's, <laughs> that, that's really the bottom line here for you. So They used to do that with video cameras. People would buy a video camera yeah. and film their high school graduation. Back. Yep. Or the holiday gathering, yeah, yeah. People, people do weird things. Richard. So you get a question that pops up on your computer, like when I'm there. Yep. Is it safe to say that 100% of the time you should pick don't allow? Is that a safe way of analyzing? Well, that? you're asking me, is it a safe 100% of the time to say no? No, it's not safe 100% of the time. Right. So is it, this, not, is it the best choice to pick don't allow? It is the best choice to choose don't allow That's what I'm to say. if you are not familiar with this website. If you do not have full faith in this website, then don't allow. 
You don't need to just about every website if you want to not have to worry about any problems at all. Should you just universally just no. Uh, you, so you're saying there are some situations where you can put it. Yes. But that is up to you. There is no there is no magic wand to say these are safe and these aren't. That's something that you would have to learn, and unfortunately, that comes with trial and error. So that's what I'm saying to be on the safe side, so you don't have to worry. It's safe for the but some of the sites, when you say don't allow, they don't let you in. Right. There's other sites where I have to be an agent. Okay. And if I have a pop up, can be a pop up to be an agent, I allow them because they can awesome. But you trust B and H versus going to a website that you haven't been to before. That's when you can be skeptical. And I would say, if you want to be skeptical and click "Don't allow," that wouldn't be a bad thing the first time. And then, if you determine that they are trustworthy, then the next time you go there, it's going to ask you again. Then you can click "Allow." Okay. It, it's you have to be yes. With anything in life, you have to be cautious. How cautious is up to you. Okay. So let me move along here. And then, last but not least, the Mac App Store has been redesigned, and I hate to keep using the phrase curated, but that's what Apple keeps calling all their redesigns. All this content is now carefully curated for you. Well, that sounds good. But if I go to Starbucks and I get a curated selection for a hot chocolate, I don't want the sprinkles on the top. That's not curated for me. That's for somebody else. If you want a latte and you don't want whipped cream, okay, well, then that's another thing that you're not getting curated. But this is what Apple has been pushing. I guess that's the new buzzword. Um, what they are doing is they're now putting more editorial comments and content into the App Store to help you when you're looking for something to try and guide you to what you really need rather than the app of the day or somebody that might be fudging the numbers to try to get their app higher up on the list. Um, they're supposedly now going to be background stories about the different apps and about the developers. So you can learn a little bit more and decide, is this somebody I want to give my money to if I'm buying an app? Um, they also have, as they're saying, more to explore by hitting the Discover tab. Um, you can find some of the newest and best apps that they think are, hey, this is it. Again. You could say it's marketing, possibly. Um, they also have different things for if you want to create, if you're using something for work or something for play. They've got those tabs to give you recommendations based on your prior purchase history. Um, the neat thing is that used to be a row across the top of the App Store for finding like updates. Well, now it's on the left side, and it's a little more organized. It threw a lot of people off, like the first week, because people were going there going, well, that's not the same thing I had before. How do I do my updates? But if you look to the left, oh, look, updates in that panel. So it's a little easier, I think, for some people, because one, they made it larger, and two, they put it really in plain sight instead of running it across the top. Because for some reason, people never looked across the top. Well, it says I need an update, but I don't know how to do it. Well, see the red circle? There's your update. That's what you click on, and it'll do it. The red circle will come up under updates on the left side. So you've got that option as well. Um, so that pretty much handles my um, presentation on Mojave. I know we're going to have questions, and we'll get to that in just a second. Um, so Apple, because we're done with cats, they moved on to California's parks. So 
That's how we had Mavericks, which was a surfing beach. Yosemite. El Capitan. Sierra. High Sierra. And now we're on Mojave. So we'll see what comes up next. Hopefully something interesting. So, yeah. So give me a second. I'm going to... So while we're here... So in Finder, you can look at things icon-wise. You can look at things in list mode. Oh, why did that? Oh, hang on. Now you can. Yes. All right. So up across the top, if I'm here, there's icon mode. There's list mode. There is the Windows world mode. I don't know what it's called, but that's what everyone calls it. Column. This is gallery. So this is new. This replaced the, uh, another version that was similar. You can go across the bottom to see what you've got and open things up. You can go, use the back arrow to go back. So that's one of the neat features. Excuse me, one of the neat features in here. Would you use the pictures directory? So cover flow is what it used to be called. Yeah. Now it's called quick look. This is really, this is especially good. I think it would be, <laughs> yeah. So if you opened up the pictures, you'd be able to scroll right through them. Um, so that's what it, that does in there. Um, I don't have... No thanks. So I can't show you the, the home app because I am on my Mac group account and that's not tied to my house. So, so unfortunately I wouldn't be able to pop that one up for you quickly. Um, let me, give me a second. Get us here in a second. Oh, so the red circle, that's Apple News. Thank you, Richard. Yep, that's new. So we'll give it a second to finish loading. So you can't get that on over computer? No. This is part of Mojave. So you need to be on something a little newer for that. Uh, so this will pull up a bunch of information. The internet seems to be awfully slow. So things are loading, but you can pick your topic. So if you want to go to politics, you can. If you want to go to health, you can do that. Boy, that is slow. But this will let you pick the different topics and you can see the news feeds that Apple is putting together for you. Um, and they're grabbing information from all the major websites uh, for news. Um, and then essentially giving you a link into that article. So that's what you can look forward to in the news app. Uh, let me, sure.
Import from iPad. Oh, so for safety sake, it wants two-factor authentication for you to use continuity. So you will have to upgrade to that if you're not. Um, I have not done that yet on the Mac group account yet. So I won't be able to show you that, but that showed you what it would take. And what would happen is this photo would change to the photo I just took of everybody in the audience. So I could just drop it right in and go from there. <laughs>